Welcome everyone to another episode of Sources, Kane Academy's podcast series on history and culture. I'm Andrew Zwerneman, your host. Recently, Sir Roger Scruton, one of the world's most prominent philosophers and writers, flew into Washington, D.C. to deliver some talks, and in his busy schedule, he carved out some time for the two of us to sit down and talk about education. I'm very grateful to Sir Roger for the time. I'm also very happy for all of you who get to listen to him. He's got such wisdom, such insight into the world of education. I truly hope you enjoy this episode. Well, good afternoon, Sir Roger, and thank you so much for receiving me. Well, we are, thank you for inviting me. Sure, and I, I hope you've had a good trip here in the United States. And uh, We are here in a lovely room, <clears throat> Powers Court room here at the Phoenix Park Hotel in Washington, D.C., and uh, it's just a real delight to be with you. I'd like to explore the topic of education, and towards that, let me begin with this. I, I recently revisited a book of yours from about a decade ago called Culture Counts, Faith and Feeling in a World Besieged. It's a wonderful book, and I highly recommend it for all of our listeners. A culture, you say, is the collective practice which renews our visions and extends our sympathies into all the corners of the heart. It is the ongoing record of the life of feeling, which offers to every new generation the examples, images, and words that teach it what to feel. Well, that quotation is full of wonderful terms, uh, pregnant words. Let's start with that phrase, the ongoing record of the life of feeling. What do you mean by that? Well, By feeling I, there, I principally mean, of course, the feelings that bind us to each other. Feelings like um, love, anger, desire, etc., which, um, which shape the human world and also shape the character of the people who participate in it. And um, these feelings can be merely crude, almost animal uh, reduced to, uh, to spontaneous reactions without thought, or they could be elevated to a higher level so that they become a form of thought, a form of meditation. And um, I think this is especially important for, for us in the world in which we live that, that we try to cultivate feeling in such a way that it really does involve understanding of the other and a recognition of all the complexities that might ensue from whatever uh, gestures we make. And I, I see culture as a fundamental part of educating emotions in that way, not just from examples, although examples are very important in, in novels and stories and so on, but through, from, through providing the words to, for giving us a sense of how language should be used in difficult moments and, and so on. Uh, elsewhere you talk about sympathy. Mm. And, and am I correct in drawing this conclusion that sympathy would be something like the, the core or the, the gathering uh, feeling or response to the other, as you put it? Yes. Uh, I mean, what it, it, it means, literally, it, uh, in the Greek uh, um, etymology, is, is uh, feeling, even suffering, with another. And, um, yes, sympathy is a form, like so many of our emotions, it's also a form of judgment. You don't feel sympathy for the villain in the story. Um, You feel sympathy for his victim, perhaps. Uh, And it's one of the ways in which we explore the human world with a view to making judgments. So... So you would say, in fact, there are things that we ought to feel and things we ought not oh, to yes, feel. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what uh, moral education ultimately is, I think. Well, let's say that we present to our students a poem mm. or um, a, a painting or maybe even a, a stage performance, of a play uh, put on a stage. Would it be appropriate to ask the students, uh, how did the... How does that painting make you feel, or how did you respond uh, how did, with feeling towards that poem or that play? Uh, that is a perfectly reasonable question, as long as you make clear that, that the poem is not about 
him, the student, the reader. It's about whatever it's about. Um, and too much obsession with what you're feeling can occlude your observation of the, the thing itself. Uh, and I think um, we live in a world in which, which there's a constant pressure to sentimentalize everything and make it always look as though feeling is what it was what everything is about right. so, so, sometimes we would say that uh, uh, to a student that it's more important for you to let the author or the painter pull you into his world absolutely. rather than you his work in yes yours. yes and um you know, you should approach works of art in a spirit of humility. This guy who's painted this picture or has written this poem, he did it for a purpose, in order to draw attention to something other than you, something which had, had um, caused him to, to respond in this vigorous way. And he wants you to understand it, its significance. Yeah, and so you, uh, in that quotation I started with, there were there were other terms besides feeling. Feeling doesn't stand alone, as you understand, as you explain it, right? Mm. There's thought, imagination, yes. uh, judgment, as you put it, vision, uh, and so is this. Um, in a sense, this is a, a cooperative effort between uh, the mind and, and the passion, or the mind and the heart. Well, yes, um, inevitably. You know, all, all feeling involves a judgment. Uh, you know, judgment of the world. What if, if I if I respond with anger to a certain remark? Uh, it's not just that I'm arbitrarily responding with anger. Uh, I've judged that that remark is offensive, and that means I've put it in a, a broader context in which I am able, or try at least, to distinguish the offensive from the inoffensive, and have a conception of why the offensive is something that I should react to. So there's a whole story of of, um, uh, of articulate thought which underpins the, the feeling. So in, when you talk about the record of feeling, uh, you know, the images, mm. and the stories, and, and so forth, so is this, uh, is this the, the history of our culture? Is it, the, is it the, the gathering of all the great works, of the classic works of, of art and literature? No, it's, but it, we have a, a collection of paradigms of, you know, uh, of, um, of emotions captured in their essential purity, in words and images and situations that enable us to relate our own lives to them. Uh, you know, simple things that when Nausicaa sees Odysseus in the corridor of the palace, um, and Homer, without describing her emotions, evokes them completely. So you have a, this wonderful picture of this um, virgin girl's uh, sexual interest, which it hasn't be, got, taken any blatant form, but is, as it were, perceiving an imagine, imaginary future for herself, uh, and then, of course, withdrawing from it as she had to. Now that, the way that Homer presents that is a complicated little episode which which draws you in through sympathy to a, a state of mind which is very uh, unfamiliar to us because of the whole context, but nevertheless we recognize to be the state of mind of someone exactly like us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so the record lies or consists exactly in the, the works themselves and, yeah. and how they engage us and uh, how the, the works illuminate our own experience. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the, they give us paradigms and, as Ma Matthew Arnold says, touchstones. You know, the, 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 the perfected expression of a state of mind to which one can add nothing and from which one can take nothing away, which tells you, you know, enables, enables you to situate your own emotional life in the context of these paradigms. And you're not. You know that, as it were, the world has been, the world of feeling has been explored, marked out, mapped, uh, you know, and its monuments declared and directed. Uh, uh, and you are not lost. You know, you're not just improvising because you can see the relation between your own, um, it, not necessarily 
very articulate efforts and these paradigms which help you to to produce the articulation you you gave an example there from classic literature mm. um, and you've you said several places I, I've read where each generation needs to uh, re-engage or renew the culture, right? Or for each generation, the culture needs to be renewed. Mm. And uh, in some ways, that seems to be the content of education, that, you know, the examples, the images, the words that, that you, uh, you stated in, in that earlier quotation. And someone might say sympathy, yes, emotional knowledge, yes, but now let's, let's get started with local culture. Let's get mm. started with the latest art or the latest music. Mm. Now, you, you've already given one example from, from Homer's Odyssey, but can you make the broader case for why we actually ought to start with the classics and the classics ought to be the, the mainstay for us as we, as we mm. experience that kind of renewal that you pointed towards? Well, you can start in lots of different places, but one argument in favor of the classics... Um, is that they've survived the test of time, and that people come, once people have ac- are acquainted with them, they re- they recognise their value, and the, and they give give you the all the raw materials from which to cr- create new things. Let's face it, uh, Homer's Odyssey has is not just something that people visit out of curiosity; it, it lives through all. The, of 19th century literature uh, and of course was resurrected by James Joyce in the form of, a, of Ulysses in the early 20th century uh, and, um, and, it, and goes on resounding through all the great works uh, that we have So, I, I, and um, that, there's a reason for that you know um, the classics that we have from the ancient world, we have only because they were treasured, and have been treasured ever. Uh, you know, because everything else has been lost in in all the catastrophes, the burnt down libraries, and so on. But these things have survived because people treasured them so much that they were prepared to safeguard them from calamities. And and we, looking back on it, we can see the reason why. Uh, it, but it, uh, of course, it's a great fallacy to think that that um, the classics were were the high point of our culture, and everything else is decline. But uh, on the contrary, but nevertheless, everything else has been made possible by them. Uh, and <clears throat> would you turn to uh, works that might not be considered uh, classics because they haven't endured so much time, but? Seem to be just the, the uh, just the kind of literature or the kind of art that that we need. So, for example, uh, would you would you consider the the novels of uh, Zolzhenitsyn or the music of Koretsky or, or someone like that more recently as a good starting points? Interesting question. I, I mean. It's better that that students attend to those things uh, than to, you know, a last exit to Brooklyn or, you know, um, or whatever. But, you know, the, I think students need a sense of the uh, of the of permanence in what they read. And they need a sense that that, a, that there is a, a something that that new works are contributing to, other than themselves. You know, they are contributing to an ongoing dialogue with the, with predecessors. Uh, all this um, was laid out in that famous essay, "Tradition and the Individual Talent," by T. S. Eliot. Uh, the the idea that the originality that we appreciate in in authors writing today is only appreciated because we can situate that author in a tradition larger than himself and the great works even the great modern works too his especially have gained their significance in part because they're written in conscious attempt to join the tradition doesn't mean that that we can't understand them without going back 
to all the predecessors, but they give us a sense that nevertheless they emerge from a, a, a deep foundation in things that have, been, that have gone before. Well, that reminds me of, um, of another emphasis of yours, uh, taken again from the, from the book Culture Counts. You, uh, you make a point about the purpose of education, and, and like so much of what you do, you link it to the, our, our communal existence mm. our, our, and our, our responsibility for, the, for our, our predecessors and yeah. for future generations. And this is what you say. You say the goal of education is to preserve our communal store of knowledge and to keep open the channels through which we can call on it when we need to. Now, that definition might rattle uh, some of our friends uh, who are practitioners of liberal or classical education mm. and uh, in the sense that they might place a, the emphasis on that term liberal, that uh, education is, is meant for freedom. Yeah. Now, so, but I want to note, is your definition uh, or your identification of the goal of education at odds with that or is it more of a complement to the, the notion of education for freedom? It's a good question. I, I mean, there are two ideas of freedom at, at stake here. There is the liberationist idea, you know, that you take away constraints and then the, uh, the, um, the psyche is released in, in order to gain, uh, to take, take possession of its space. And that's a, a, that liberationist picture of freedom is very different from the idea of freedom under law, you know, the, the freedom which is a form of obedience because it's a recognition of the, of the rational possibilities available to you. Um, that second view of freedom is the one that I would maintain. Uh, and I think a lot of damage was done to education, in particular by John Dewey, in espousing the first of those views, you know, that education is a liberation of the student. In my view, it's not. It's a disciplining of the student in order that real freedom can be enjoyed. Um, in another passage, you <clears throat> encourage teachers uh, regarding the teaching of, of art and literature, and you say the following, say, by inducing the love of art and literature, teachers perpetuate the knowledge of the human heart, Ideal visions of the human condition, not only of what we are, but of what we are capable of, are distilled in the works of our culture. From these visions, we acquire a sense of what is intrinsically worthwhile in the human condition, a recognition that our lives are not consumed in the fire of means only, but devoted also to the pursuit of intrinsic values. I would love to hear you elaborate on your use of the word vision there. And uh, why is it so crucial that we have vision and that teachers impart vision to their students? Well, <clears throat> the world is very boring unless we make it interesting. Uh, and to make it interesting, we should be constantly looking for uh, the moments in which imagination can take over, in which you can compare uh, what you have with what you might have. Uh, in which you set an imaginary world beside the present one, or in which you rethink the present one as though it were part of an imagined one. Uh, and that's what a writer or a poet, what a poet does, you know, is to, uh, even if he's like William Carlos Williams, simply describing a bowl of fruit on the table or whatever, um, he, is, uh, he, he is reimagining it uh, as though it were living in its own possibilities. Uh, and I think that's what I mean. And not, not getting lost in, uh, in fantasy pictures of things, but, but looking at the world in another way uh, so as to understand that, it's, it, that, that it, it is a, a sphere of possibilities incarnate in an actuality. Mm. And looking at it another way... Um I mean, there would be other claimants to that that we would call ideologists, right? So they would create a second reality. They're not looking at the world and reimagining it with a, a clear connection to the world, but rather apart from it, right? Yes. At odds with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the um, emotional knowledge and emotional intelligence yes. about which you speak, th this is language, uh, sometimes you encounter this in the... Uh, you know, business journals, yes. and uh, you know, 
all sorts of people have something to say about that. Uh, can, can you kind of anchor that for us as a good way of thinking about what it is we're doing when we're teaching yes. our students? I mean, uh, you, as you rightly say, there's a there's an element of psychobabble in the way that people use these terms. Uh, you know, it's, it's the invasion of ordinary life by therapy. Um, and I don't mean that. I, I mean to turn, just to refer to, to um, the education of the emotions from raw reactions to fully sympathetic responses. Uh, and this involves educating the character. I mean, one of the best authorities on the education of the emotions is Aristotle in his theory of virtue. But, uh, but the language he uses is not really accessible to young people today. But I think you can, um, you can point out the difference between untutored reactions to things and considered responses. Uh, and show that the considered response is not a weaker form of feeling. It might be a, a more heartfelt form of feeling, but it involves understanding and sympathy at a higher level. I, I've actually had some success teaching the ethics to, to young people. Oh, good. Um, mm. But it's interesting that sometimes a, a, a group of students will divide. There'll be the, mm. the students who love the dialogues of Plato and they, they don't like the, the ethics. And the yeah. students, oh, I'm so glad we're reading the ethics. So they, mm. I wasn't really cooking with Plato in the dialogue. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so maybe partly a matter of taste. Might be my own uh, teaching yes. successes and failures. Too. Right, yeah. well, I don't know. Yeah. I was very intrigued by something else that you, you said in your book, and you had a comment to make about the, the role of culture at a time when religion uh, has, has fallen off as, a, as a normative for, for mm. most people. And you're you're relatively sanguine, maybe very sanguine about the role of culture, reminding us of our worth, of our of our best feelings, our best mm. sympathy for the human condition. I wanted to know if you would please elaborate on that. Yes, uh, I think we all of us need that sense of our own worth, and without it, we somehow don't trust our own experience and and don't feel that we're gaining any power over our own condition that you know we uh, and i think we all of us need to know that we are f that we fully belong in the world which is ours that we have our sphere of influence where we can exercise our p powers and uh, that in turn does require this sense that somehow it's it's um, Oh, it's right to be the thing that I am. You know, that, that there, uh, uh, there is an endorsement that I can rely upon. We depend upon others, of course, to provide that endorsement. But there is a great question of how, how it comes to us from the surrounding world. We don't live only expecting to be patted on the back by our wives and children and parents. We do live in the hope that we fit into a wider... Uh, community uh, with which we are in sympathetic contact and that it's that community uh, that doesn't just accept our existence but recognises it as valuable and I think culture as I understand it is the articulate voice of a community which, um, which, be, which is not a community of intimates it's a community of strangers people you've never met people are dead people like Homer you know but nevertheless they speak directly to you and say you know um, here is how you might live and then you think yes that's true and living like that you feel uh, supported and that seems to me a beautiful articulation of a true moral and spiritual freedom uh, articulation of of a kind of health even and uh, an antidote to the kind of division that marks our time people are divided from one another they're divided from their past and yes and it seems it, it seems a, a, that a culture that reminds us of our worth is is, is a culture that's very hopeful well of course uh, um true art in my view is an affirmation an affirmation of the world of the person who's appreciating it even if it's art made at another time in another place etc and um, 
we're we're always searching for the way to affirm things and we can only affirm things if we affirm them as home as the place where we, we belong and that is a communal idea do you um, how important is it do you think for students for young people especially to, to play music together oh it's absolutely vital um, to Playing music together is a way of understanding your shared, the shared dynamic of the human body for a start, uh, and uh, uh, and that your embodiment is your way of being. Uh, and uh, you know we are rhythmic creatures, but merely tapping your foot to the uh, you know, to the rhythm in your ear is a completely different thing from working out. The notes in your fingers and he- and hearing and responding spontaneously to the person who's who's playing with you, uh, and, and you know, and that's an extremely difficult thing to do. You can't do it by measurement uh, because all performance has an element of rubato, and you're you are spontaneously responding to another person's uh, variations by by joining in with them. It's not that different from a, a flock of birds. When you see a flock suddenly start up from the hedgerow and sweep into the sky and then go round in a circle and come down again. This is, you know, there's some 2,000 birds flying just an inch apart of each other. But every movement of one bird is immediately mirrored by the next. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of neurological explanations of this, but the fact is that that's uh, a kind of miracle of nature which we need to replicate every now and then in ourselves, and music is the best way of doing it. That's an interesting emphasis, that, that physical dynamism. I think sometimes someone commenting on this might say that the... might start with, the, uh, with music as a common language, mm. something that helps us transcend ourselves. You know, think about the... Uh, wonderful programs in uh, Venezuela, El Sistema, where uh, yes. uh, children of all backgrounds are playing classical music. We're seeing this in a uh, in our country we have what are called public charter schools and these right, are public yes. schools that uh, like the, the Great Arts Academies uh, we, and, and you know um, Rod Jackson and, and um, the folks in Arizona. So they're given more license uh, in the charter schools to do programs independent from the typical public right. schools. And, so we work with a school in Colorado, uh, the Thomas McLaren School. Right. About 400 students, all of them study um, stringed instruments. Yes, no, I've seen that. Uh, and that's fantastic. I think that's how it should be done. Um, and, of course, it, it, it raises the question of the different kinds of music that kids might be listening to or performing, you know, and uh, um, inevitably I would have a prejudice for the classical partly because it involves long-term thinking and long-term listening rather than repetition. Yes. And uh, do you think there's something comparable in the experience of uh, acting on stage, oh, yeah. an ensemble of actors? Yes, acting is a, a very... Um, it's another way, of course, of coordinating with others spontaneously. Yeah. Do, you, do you place any uh, value in... The um, uh, the art form of film. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. I mean, I, um, the problem with film, of course, is that it's very easily debased uh, because people are you, people's um, interest in images it can be easily awoken, and it can be awoken in the for the wrong reasons in the wrong way, as we know from you know the. the Violence in the cinema and pornography and all, all the rest that sure. that uh, you can easily capture the attention of someone with with images that that degrade the human condition. Uh, are, are there directors or, or um, genres within film that you think are are most successful in, in fostering a sympathy for the human condition? Well, yes, I mean. Uh, 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 that, in my view, truly artistic cinema has to fight against that that abuse of images, and the abuse which which makes people interested in the image simply because it, it arouses in him some some body relax, reaction. You know, it, uh, 
if you show a, a, a film, have a book banal, the action and the characters in which they slice each other up in a, in, in a bloody way um, like in Tarantino's films mm. There's, you know, inevitably people come out of the cinema thinking they've had a great experience but in fact they've had no experience at all it's simply been their, uh, their innate fears that have been uh, encroached upon uh, in a drama which has no intrinsic sense and no uh, human characters uh, and in the old days the old art cinema there was an attempt to use the cinematic materials as a form of drama, as an extension of the theatre. You see that in Bergman, of course, uh, in something like Wild Strawberries, which is a, actually a you know it's like an Ibsen play that has to, that has been set a bit in motion. And I think um, one needs to learn from those people because they they were totally aware of the corrupting nature of images and wanted to discipline them. Well, this was a, a great moment because I think everyone in podcast land was waiting for Sir Roger Scruton to endorse at least one <laughs> great <laughs> film director. Right, so we yeah. had a Bergman. <laughs> yeah, it's what, yeah, uh, Bergman and Renoir and all those people, and really lots more. And of course, uh, um, you quite a lot of the early American films are like that. But, um, you know, it's true that it's not, it, it, there are uses of the cinema which are. Uh, you know, we we need to think about as as though they create a new realms of artistic expression, and that that is possible, I think. Uh, but um, anyway, that's really very good. Uh, education, of course, is uh, one of the central means by which we raise children. We raise children to become adults, and of course, we say that education is for a lifetime. We love lifetime mm. learners. Our mission, uh, in part, is dedicated to helping adult learners and different programs. But it seems that educating the young is job number one. So how exactly are classic works of literature and art necessary for the, for the specific process of growing up, becoming adults? You've, you've spoken to some of the, the attributes of, of classical mm. uh, literature and, and art, but can you, can you take that one step further and say, aha, this is, this is exactly what the doctor ordered for young people in particular <clears throat> well, to become adults I, I, I'm not sure that I'd say it is exactly what, what, what it's ordered but um, I think we, we should recognize well, this follows on from thinking about film there's a distinction between the use and the abuse of the imagination uh, and uh, the imagination has an enormously important role in, in uh, helping children to grow up. That's to say, to give them a sense of possibilities uh, and their own place within those possibilities. Uh, and one of the advantages of the classical of classical literature is that it takes them into a world where they have to imagine it, they ha but they also have have to find in it the cre the people. And the situations with which they can identify, uh, and they do because this, uh, real literature always creates those situations. And it, so that <clears throat> this is a very important growing up moment when you recognise that um, you know that the anger of Achilles is no different from the anger that you would feel in those circumstances, but it's the anger of, of a different person in a completely different world. So you have some grasp of your the, f the fact the human condition is is much larger than the circumstances of your own life to date, uh, and therefore that you know generalising that there's this huge world out there into which you are being invited, uh, and I think this, uh, that that use of the imagination is is um, amplified by the study of classical literature. Uh, and I think all it's one reason why it's so popular among the young once you introduce them to it. 
but you have some hesitation about its fittingness for young people. You no. say you, you, you wondered about my my phrase that you know that's just what the doctor ordered. You well, I, I know, I, all I mean is it's not the only way uh, to to in uh, to bring pe- young people into the into an imaginative conception of the adult world. Um, you have. Um, you had an extraordinary experience as a young man uh, uh, in uh, what we used to call the uh, the Eastern Bloc countries, right? So uh, right. during a time of uh, communist reign in Eastern Europe. And I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about what you learned from that time, how it formed especially your thoughts about education. Well, yes. One very important observation that uh, that I made at that time was that uh, that uh, the hunger for knowledge as an end in itself is not extinguished just because all the educational networks around you are treating knowledge as a means to an end, you know, as a form of indoctrination or uh, inducing conformity to the surrounding political order that in fact um, it's in human nature to look at knowledge in a completely different way from that as something of intrinsic value uh, especially when you feel that uh, that um, you're being controlled by the educational system uh, then you do hunger for a completely open uh, reasoned uh, uh, and objective confrontation with the with the cultural inheritance. That's what, at least, I felt that very much in um, in the Czech lands and and in Poland. Uh, so that young people in those countries had a great love for and hunger for their national culture uh, um, as something which belonged to them and which was a realm of freedom. Uh, even though it was not taught in schools and so on. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the, 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 their education system wasn't that bad either. Um, but, but many of the best students were excluded from, from university, at least. In, in, if I remember correctly, you helped facilitate, uh, was it the founding of a university or the sustaining yeah. uh, underground university? Or? Yeah, we, ha- we did start up a, an underground university in, in uh, Czech lands. And, it, and it, it carried on until the collapse of communism. And uh, so you were there to, to help people who were suffering. You, you also endured some suffering yourself too, right? Well, I, I was never bad, uh, that bad. I was arrested and interrogated and, and thrown out. But well, you know, that'll do. I mean, <laughs> well, most of us would say that'll do. Okay. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So it, it must have been. Well, was it terribly difficult for you and your your colleagues, your friends, and allies to to maintain hope in those dire situations? Yes, I, I, it wasn't difficult. Really, because um, you know it's natural in, for human beings to hope, uh, and um, when you're living in a situation of uh, of total oppression, uh, in which the, you know, elementary freedoms have been confiscated, uh, you you know you, you encourage each other to hope even though you're not quite sure what for, but there was always this sense that this, this cannot last. This is, uh, uh, this is so full of uh, self-contradiction uh, and mutual ant- antagonism that it will collapse. And I never believed that. Uh, and my view was, no, I'm afraid you, that you're going to be in this prison forever, but at least I'm going to bring you um, a, a few books to read. And, um, but then it did collapse. Yeah, so uh, do you have any advice for us today uh, about good sources of hope? So you you pointed to two things in a sense that are very important. One is you you had friends Mm. and, 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 you know, if they, if some of them believed that communism would collapse, and you didn't, you still had one another, and you still yes, were really do exactly. be generous with one another. So that seems to be a good starting point. But do you have any other advice for our listeners about 
uh, working together and, and uh, fostering hope amongst ourselves. Well, yes. Uh, um, Ed, it's not so different from making music together, mm-hmm. making hope together. It, it's a way of reverberating to each other's uh, instinctive feelings uh, and becoming becoming a, a, an entity, a first person plural, which is more, greater than the sum of the individuals that compose it. And, I, and I, I think it can be done on a small scale in a local community uh, and it can grow. I think that hope can't be imposed from on top. It can only ever grow from below anyway, as it did, of course, in the early days of Christianity. And you, uh, we say, we have a phrase, you know, that uh, one, you put your money where your mouth is, or, and, and you actually uh, live out what you uh, preach. So not only do you, you play organ, right, at your church, yeah. and uh, you've composed uh, an opera and shared that with uh, the public. And do, you, do you have a, a, a quartet or an, an ensemble? No, unfortunately, I, I wish I did, but I live in the country where it is quite difficult to make music with others, <laughs> um, uh, especially nowadays when there's so little musical education. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I, I enjoy nothing more than a, accompanying a leader. Yeah. Very good. Well, we're very grateful for all of your writing and for all your speaking. It's, uh, it's a great source of encouragement and uh, a wellspring of insight and wisdom. Mm-hmm. We're so grateful for all that you do. Thanks so much for all that. And thanks, too, again, for, for joining me today. Uh, uh, I know that you didn't fly across the pond just to be with me, but I appreciate you carving out some time to, to spend with us. And all, on behalf of all our, our listeners and for everyone who works at Keene Academy, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's very interesting. I hope you enjoyed the conversation today with Sir Roger Scruton. If you'd like to read what he had to say, you can find a transcript of the interview at our website. Just go to www.kanaacademy.org and then head for our blog post. You'll find a transcribed version of the interview there. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I'm Andrew Zorneman, your host. For everybody on the team at Kana Academy, we hope you'll join us next time on Sources.